Captain's Log, Supplemental. We were less than three days out of dock before I had to issue my first disciplinary action on a member of the crew. Several of our new cadets, fresh out of Starfleet, brought a popular social game along with them called Amidst Us. Uh, it seemed relatively benign at first. Some of the veteran bridge crew even joined in on the fun, but uh, somebody managed to smuggle some honest-to-god moonshine on board and got a little too passionate with their play. I draw the line at drunken attempts to flush a suspected imposter out of an actual airlock. Welcome back, everybody, to Captain's Log Supplemental. I am Chris, joined by Rob and Stanford. How are we all doing today? Doing well. How are you? Super. Uh, just as a reminder to all the listeners out there, please rate and subscribe. That always helps us out, and it is much appreciated. Dad, leave a review, too. Oh, yeah. Do that, too. If uh, if we get good reviews, we uh, will read around the show. That reminds me we have our first hate mail. Oh. Do we really? Yeah, it's from my friend John, though, so I don't think it really counts. <laughs> oh. <laughs> nice. Uh, let's All see. Right. Um, he says that our potpourri section should be named after some variant of Flotsam and Jetsam, and now we cannot do that because it's too good of an idea. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, so he's only heard episode three, which means I don't think we've actually nailed it down as potpourri yet by then. No, I'm sure, I feel I'm, like that was very recent. I'm also about 80% sure that name is going to change at some point. Better not. I love it. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, with all that said, let's get into the episode. Uh, today we are discussing episode 12, Silent Enemy of Enterprise. We kind of uh, begin the episode with a, looks like a probe launching from the Enterprise. It's actually a uh, subspace relay so they can communicate back to Earth. And uh, everybody's getting a little bit excited about it because we get to finally say hi to everybody again, which is, you know, that's just so nice. Get to have a little chit chat with the with the folks back home. Now, I, I'm not a NASA engineer, but like, should those come out of the ship a little faster so that you don't risk hitting it with the ship? Just like, pew, like yeah, shoot it out. Because it like, it just kind of meanders out. It's just like, do to do And that just seems like a real big collision risk. Yeah. Well, like in like the later Star Treks, like in like Next Generation, they always shoot, when they, you know, dispatch a probe, they always like shoot it like a torpedo, it seems like. Right. Well, that's a probe, right? But this is more like a, Satellite, like a, like a relay, like a, I think they called right. it or some shit. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. it's just going to stay yeah. there. But I feel like they should, I don't know. It should get out of the way a little quicker. Well, you see the, the, the difficulty they've had with launching shuttles and, and whatnot. So, you know, it's, it's, right. it's, 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 it's tough for them. And like, if you've and ever like, seen, go ahead. If you've ever seen like a, a space shuttle launch, there are tiny little rockets on each of the components as well that like blast them away from the main hull specifically for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Like, get oh, it yeah, out yeah, of the yeah. Way. Yeah, and like, and like, I I can understand that, like, but they want to know where this one is. And at first, I'm like, well, maybe they just want to keep it fairly stationary so they can find it again. But then I realized, like, no, no, no. No matter how hard they launched it, it's still going to be going basically zero speed as compared to like warp and subspace communications. So like, get that fucker moving, man. Get it away from you. Mm. So, uh, shortly after they launch the relay antenna, a mysterious alien, sh alien ship drops out of warp. The Enterprise and Archer try to, try to hail them, but they don't seem so talkative, and they, without doing anything else, they immediately warp out of there. Uh, I, 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 this whole open, I have another note. Go ahead. So, Hoshi, I think, was like, the channel's open, Captain, because the captain's like, can they hear us? Yeah. How did... How do comms work? Like, how do they know? Is there like a read receipt? Like in, like in a text message? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think, I think she means more like we are broadcasting right now. Right. They may that's not be listening, it. but we're at least but broadcasting. I don't know. I'm not sure that's what she means because like they are always in these shows, like hail them. And then they like, don't, don't answer back or whatever. It's like, oh, okay. Or like, 
like, you know, communicate with them or comms, you know, they're refusing our comms or whatever. Like, it just seems like there's some kind of handshake going on that doesn't make any sense. All right, never mind. Yeah, it wasn't a good point. You can you can go. <laughs> so uh, uh, Reed mentions that he got nothing on sensors. You know, he couldn't pick up anything through the 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 barriers that the the enemy ship had mm-hmm. on. So they have no idea. You know, who was on it? How many people there were? Who were they? What type of people they were? Weapons, so much. Anything. So much for that invasion of privacy thing. <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, we got to scan. We got to. So uh, T'Pol points out that they may not understand every species' motives, which I think is actually a good point. Um, yeah. I I also liked Travis. Travis was like the first time I think we've seen in the show where they just admit the fact that maybe humans aren't as interesting as we all think that we are. Like, no. Archer's always going on like, hi, I'm Jonathan Archer from the planet Earth. I'm a human. And like, I don't know, man, maybe they just don't care. Maybe they just don't care. That's a good point. Uh, afterwards, Hoshi covertly kind of motions Archer over and says she found, you know, she found those people and then Archer's going to take it in his, you know, his his room so we can talk to them privately. And we find out shortly after that, that it was it's Reed's parents and he's trying to get some kind of you know, insider information on what Reed likes, because apparently he's a complete enigma to everybody. Just just nobody knows. And I I might add, they are very British. Reed's dad is so douchey, too. He's such (laughs) a dick the whole time. The whole time. It was fun seeing them, though. I think it's also interesting. I don't know how often we get to see, like, civilian attire. Like, his dad's just wearing a polo shirt. Oh, was he? You know, I didn't even notice that. I like how his dad's like had to go and be a stupid lame space naval person instead of a cool ass <laughs> water naval person like his right. family. Like who's gonna choose not space in that situation? Apparently, Reed's dad. Yeah, mm-hmm. the water is just fine for him. So I've got this whole thing about Reed's family, Reed's dad, da, 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 and then I've got this note which is like, what "The fuck are we doing here? Is this a '90s sitcom?" <laughs> so like, I was I just had a note ask that- him. I had a note that like the whole like A and oops, bumped my mic there. Sorry. Uh, the whole A and B plots are like very whiplash in this episode. Yes. Like we go from, you know, imminent, very real danger from this alien ship to party planning, I guess. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just a very odd dichotomy going on in this episode. Right. 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 Uh, and, and, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, so, you know, you know, we we discover from from Reed's parents that he's a weirdo who doesn't really have a favorite food or or so we think. Man, I don't have a favorite food. If you ask my parents what my favorite food is, they would not be able to tell you an answer. Like, I don't have a favorite food. I've got things I like, but I don't have a favorite food. You've got things you like really like though, like if you're given a choice between like three or four things. Rob, you know me pretty well. Do I have a favorite food? Like maybe I don't not even know what it fries. is. No, I do not like French fries. <laughs> I don't I, know. You really like Chinese food. I do. Like a lot. I do. I like egg rolls. Like egg rolls are like my thing egg from rolls. a Chinese place. I do. If I had to pick a cuisine to eat forever, it'd probably be Mexican though. Oh, Mexican's um, so good. followed by maybe mm. Indian. Mm. Um, actually we had Indian, oh, Indian. last night. Oh, so good. <laughs> so anyway, Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> uh, after the, were you going to say something? I was just going to say, like, because Archer doesn't get anything out of them. And then he's like, Hoshi, this is your top priority. And right. I'm like, fuck, <laughs> why? What? This isn't, this is, what the, also, like. Disregard the no, new this, alien species we just discovered. Right, right, right. Communications also, officer, you got to find what he wants to eat. It also feels very much like, you know, to Paul gets a buy because she's a Vulcan. So Hoshi's the last, like lady on the bridge so it feels very much like oh just make the woman play in the office parties like that's some that's some shit sexism right there i was gonna say this is like this is american corporate like Mm -hmm. culture to a t i mean to be fair she's not planning the office party she's just supposed to discover what his favorite food is (laughs) but here's the thing though like to paul as we established is the xo that is her job like that's what an xo does She's too busy XOing. But also, like, 
if it's like, okay, well, this is not, this is not, so, th- and this is why I say it's fucking sexism because it, it and, and, and I'm not saying it was on purpose. Like it's unconscious sexism from 2001 here. Right. Um, maybe two by now. Um, but like Archer could have asked to Paul, that is her actual job, but the writers don't want to do that. That's fine. The next person that Archer should ask from a logical writing standpoint is trip because this is not like a military thing. This is a personal friendship thing. And Archer and trip are best buds and trip and Reed kind of like they're, they're fairly friendly, even if they're not like the friendliest people, but also trip is like everybody's buddy. That's like his role that the writers have been using. But as soon as it comes to planning a fucking birthday party, they just they just default to Hoshi. <laughs> Look, Hoshi hasn't been getting much screen time the last couple episodes. She just she she needed, she needed more screen time. Like, and the writers, being Star Trek writers from the early two thousands, had only one way to do that. It would have been. It, it's just as bad as if it was like like in today's episode. Uh, you know, it's it's titled "Can't Stand the Heat," and it's like, oh, Chef is sick, and we need to cook all this food, and so Hoshi has to go do that. And she does mention she likes to cook in this episode as well. Well, yeah, I mean, that's just how it goes. And then because of a water pipe issue, she has to lose her shoes during it. <laughs> like, that's how bad this is. Oh, uh, gosh. Anyways. So, Archer orders Hoshi to find out what Reed's favorite food is. It's a very important mission. Top priority. So later on, Trip and Archer kind of chit-chatting as they walk down the hallway. Uh, Trip got a Dear John letter from his, his lady back home, which is, you know, that's sad. But, I mean, what did he expect? Is that sure. is that the conversation where he's like, you missed to Paul's latest bout with chopsticks? Yes, that was yeah. before. Uh-huh. Um, oh, that was funny. Could she, could she not, like, uh, you know, I know that I have a bias because I was raised with, like, a fair amount of Japanese influence because my parents, you know, met in Okinawa and whatnot. But, like, chopsticks are not that hard to use. And she's a Vulcan. I I don't know why, but when, when this conversation happened, I, I just, it, like, inside my own headcanon decided, oh, I guess Vulcans just eat everything with pitas. I don't know why that popped into my brain. No. No, actually, that's funny because very specifically, Vulcans do not eat with their fingers. Yep. That was oh. established in, like, I think the pilot episode. Because yeah, she cuts, when... like, the hard breadstick with a knife and a fork. Right. Huh. Yeah, they do not eat with their fingers. So uncivilized. So shortly after that, the alien ship returns. They're uh, still not chatty, but this time they are screechy and shooty. So they... Oh, oh yeah. I was like, so this <laughs> happens sometimes. Do Starfleet comm speakers not just have like a volume limiter? <laughs> right. it's, it's, like, it's just like, let that, let that fucker deafen the entire crew. Yeah. Who cares? No, that's, that's, that's good. They're, they're, they add that in afterwards. They're learning as they go. <laughs> So they, uh, the alien ship fires upon them, kind of does some, some minimal damage. Um, they do get some scans and they figure out there's, you know, a handful of people on the ship and they, uh, they get the repairs going. Archer and Paul realize kind of at this point that they need to upgrade the weapons. And this is where phase cannons are, are finally introduced in the show. And we don't have just lame ass torpedoes anymore. To, to, to Paul during this conversation says something very interesting too, because Archer's like, you know, it feels like every week so something horrible happens, <laughs> which is like, yeah, that's, that's why you're a TV show. But to Paul. And so he's like, was it like this when y'all were exploring space? And to Paul says, well, there were fewer warp capable species back then. That's, that's very interesting. Cause like, why? I'm not right. saying like, it, I'm not saying it doesn't make sense. But I am saying that that's the kind of thing that needs a reason, right? Sure. Because, like, it's definitely implied in, like, other times in Star Trek. There's, like, you know, there's been rise and fall of various empires and, you know, alien civilizations that have been warp capable before um, that are just, you know, kind of gone extinct at this point. Right, right, right. this This is also one of the potential solutions to the Fermi Paradox, which... Like maybe there just aren't advanced spacefaring species in the Milky Way yet. So maybe it's the the same kind of thing. Maybe Vulcans were just one of the first ones. Right, right. Yeah. The uh I the solution has a name that's like first to the party or something like that. Hmm. There's a name for that solution to the Fermi paradox. 
So we then get a little, <clears throat> little scene with uh, Reed and Trip arguing with Archer about how they we don't need to go back to Earth to install these phase cannons. We just we can we can do it all ourselves. But eventually Archer, you know, ends up overruling them and they they start heading back to Earth. I'm I'm kind of curious as to why they they argued about this, to be honest, like. Yeah, I was wondering, like, just from a purely tactical standpoint, why would you want to exhaust your engineering crew while you're being actively hunted by an aggressive, like, assailant? That doesn't make any sense. I agree. Like, they told them they wanted them working around the clock. Yeah, I didn't understand this either, because, like, by definition, too, like, you're going to be having some fairly dangerous work with that kind of schedule. So it's like, wh why are we, why are we risking this? Yep. And on so like a several like, year mission, a couple of weeks in dry dock to get your phasers installed doesn't seem like that big of a loss. Right. No. So, uh, so anyway, Tripp and, and Reed start, decide to kind of just start working on it anyway, on the way back to, uh, to earth so they can have as much done and spend as little time as possible in dry dock, which, okay, sure. I mean, that, I guess makes sense. You know, maybe you can have something done when the alien ship comes back. So then we get, uh, we get, we get whiplash at this point. Uh, Reed, uh, we're, we're once again on the B plot with, uh, Hoshi, <coughs> Hoshi this time talking to Reed's sister, who's, uh, much more personable than, <laughs> than her parents or Reed for that matter. Um, but still doesn't know his favorite food. Uh, she also talks to some other rando crewman who also is not helpful. <laughs> She tells Archer or somebody, she's like, I can't figure this shit out. I talked to his sister. I talked to his, like, I think it was like a Starfleet Academy roommate or something. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then she's like, I talked to his two spinster, spinster aunts. Spinster aunts. Yeah. I'm like, oof. I was like, what the <laughs> fuck kind of weird ass judgment is that? Do we just assume that like, are those two lesbians who weren't allowed to be married because it was 2002? <laughs> or like, are they just like spinster is such a strong judgment, especially for like 2350 or whatever this was supposed to be. All right. Is, is, is spinster or crazy cat lady worse? <laughs> like, so which of crazy cat lady is, is also not great, but at least like, that's not a judgment upon their, like their like sexuality. It's the sex. Uh, it's like bringing sex into it because I see what you're saying, because a spinster is literally a woman who never married. And like whether or not her interests are cats is at least something about her personally, <laughs> as opposed to just like she never married this worthless bitch. Like fucking hell. Uh, yeah. Spinster yeah, is the word we're using. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. So who she then, uh, oh, crap. Hold on. Sorry. My notes are confusing here. Oh, um, Hoshi has that awkward meal with him. I think. Yes. Hoshi tries to speak to Reed directly. Uh, oh, it's so good. So, so awkward. awkward. So awkward. Hoshi's like trying to just make conversation and kind of dance around the subject. So she doesn't tell Reed, you know, what, what exactly is going on at, at which point Reed perceives this as Hoshi hitting on him, trying, <laughs> trying to get, get him to come to her apartment or her nineties uh, sitcom. Like I was yeah. expecting like a Seinfeld musical sting after this scene. Boom, 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 boom. Dude, the, this was, a, this was like the first time in the series though, that I felt like Reed had natural, like a natural conversation with somebody like you his think that's dialogue. Natural? Like, to be his fair, his dialogue up till now has been very stilted, and, and yeah. like I, well, well, I feel like the writers have kind of been using him to fill in where they yes. need to. And that's what I was going to say. Like to be fair, this is the first time we've seen in this show like an opportunity for him to have a real conversation, because yeah. until now he was either on the job or saying something like pithy and stupid, right? One liners here or there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like this episode specifically because we actually got to know him a little bit. Yeah, he seems like less of a douche once you actually get to talk to him. Yeah, yeah, I agree there. So once again, Hoshi learns nothing. <laughs> um, uh, and then we're immediately whiplashed back to the uh, the alien ship is now following them. Uh, it, it, you know, attacks them again. It knocks out all their power and. It launches the shuttle and boards the Enterprise. <laughs> this is where I'm like, intercoms, like wall-mounted intercoms should like never go down. Like, why is that op like available? What? Why? Yeah. Why is that system not just hardwired? Reasons. 
Like, I understand why comm badges would go down, because there's a fair amount of complication in, like, pairing devices and frequencies and all that shit. But if you've got a wall-mounted... There are wall-mounted intercoms in houses from, like, the 70s that still work just fine. Look, we we had to have spoopy Mars attacks time, okay? Mm, bah, 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 bah. Yes! <laughs> yeah, those creepy-ass aliens walking down the hall. I, I, my, my exact uh, notes on this were... Um, Mars, uh, Mars attacks ass weird aliens. Uh, I have my note going, well, don't mind us as they kind of wander by. <laughs> Dude, uh, the, the later like close ups you see with their eye nubs, it was super creepy. Yeah, they're, they're pretty weird looking. Some good CGI walking, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was that was CGI walking. That's true. Um, so. Yeah, the alien kind of down two crewmen are, are doing some scans when the rest of the, the, you know, the crew show up and try to fire on them. And it has no effect whatsoever. They're just like, hmm, that tickles. That's, that's, that's nice. We're just going to take a nice leisurely stroll this way now. I'll see you later. Just a very odd, <laughs> like, alien interaction. Yeah, and I, it's fair that, like, it's, I don't mind the... These aliens obviously have some kind of motivation that we do not understand. That's fine. I don't have a problem with aliens acting weird, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, shortly after that, we're, we're in the bed bay and uh, the, we see the, the men who are down, but they're not dead, even though they look very dead, just eyes weirdly open. They've got some type of possible neuro damage or something like that. Flock says due to the invasive scans that were done. Uh, but they're they're still alive. Nobody's died yet. The uh, Enterprise is damaged and and stranded basically. Um, and they shortly they try to call for help from the Vulcans. And then at this point, they realize the uh, the the relay satellites they've already dropped have been destroyed. I think is this the part like right before this we cut to like Reed like checking the phaser pipes because <laughs> like. He's in like a Jeffrey's tube and there's just like iron pipes floating around him that he's like working on. Mm -hmm. And it's like, is is that where the phasers come out? Like, what is what are these pipes doing? They're piping. Uh, yeah. But yeah. And then and then is it Trip or Archer who's like, Ugh, I'm going to call the Vulcans lives on the line, whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, it uh, was weird, ahead. though, because like one of the one of the other bits where Archer comes in, he's like. He's talking about regretting his past decisions, like how they went out of dock early to right. get that Klingon back home. Like it, it is, it's like a, a, a freaking, oh my God, what's the word? Like when you get hit with in a car, a whiplash, it was real whiplash hearing him feel, I don't know, uncertain about his decisions. He also does the worst acting job he's done so far in that scene. <laughs> where he's like he's like trying to give this like inspirational but also like like mea culpa speech mm -hmm. and it's just it's awful i don't know i don't know if bacula was sick that day it is not well acted even a little bit yeah oh captain dewer is, is second guessing himself on on launching the enterprise early before they they had their guns which i mean sure <laughs> and i like and i like how he captain archer in the middle of this is like God, now I've put the lives of 81 crew members of Vulcan and De Denobulin at risk. And Trip's like, hey, don't forget about Porthos. <laughs> <laughs> Can't forget the pup. Um, nope. I, although it seems like Archer does fairly often forget the pup. Like, Yeah, just, although he was on a walk this morning. Oh, yeah, that's, Porthos that's is, true. Porthos is the goodest boy. He's the, he's the goodest. But uh, Trip gives, gives him a little pep talk and everything's fine. So we're we're good. Um, we then kind of go, go into a screen where, where Trip and Reader are talking to each other and, uh, they're kind of arguing a little bit back and forth about, you know, should we overcharge the weapons and this and that, and, you know, Reed's saying it's worth the risk and Trip's like, not a, I'm doing that. Got plate safe. And then like almost immediately changes his mind. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because of that awesome speech by by Archer. Uh huh. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, we uh, we get a little little, little phase cannon test, um, and you know Archer tells him just you know shave a few meters off the top of that little mountain there, and then they fucking annihilate it, <laughs> which was <laughs> <Yeah>. incredible. <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
but they find they find out that there's like some device in in the launch bay too, which by the way, not a small device, like a giant thing. No. But yeah, like, but at least it's like it's like up in the corner. No one's really looking there, you know. Because I it's mean, in like the I cargo feel like they bay. would have looked there. No, it was in the launch bay that they came into. <laughs> like, the, oh yeah, I guess I guess there should be like a hey, we got boarded by aliens procedure where like right, Maybe you like check for shit. Yeah, but There's also the thing some was sort of security out, procedure there. The thing was putting out six megajoules into into their grid. Did they not have any way to detect that? <laughs> Uh, yeah. I'm like, I'm not, a, I'm not an electrical engineer, but six megajoules sounds like a lot. <laughs> so they, they discover that the, uh, the aliens are at this point peeping on them like a bunch of perverts. And uh, Archer does a little tough guy speech to him through their, <laughs> through, their the, through their camera. The least intimidating fisheye camera angle speech <laughs> ever given. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, he, he blows up the little device thing. Um, and we, we move back into the med bay and, and we get news that, that thank God, the, the two crewmen who we have no idea who they are, they're safe. They're fine. Whew. I was very concerned about crewman A and crewman B. Me too. Uh, Hoshi is at this point still looking for Reed's favorite food. Um, and uh, they start. Best, best line in the show right here. Well, which one? Medically speaking, there's no accounting for taste. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> brilliant line. I don't know who uh, wrote that. I don't know if the actor ad libbed it. Fucking brilliant line. Well yeah, done. It was pretty good. It was pretty good. I, and also that conversation made me very hungry because I hadn't eaten dinner yet. And they kept ooh, going mistake. on about like eggs and like sausage and bacon and omelets and shit. I'm like, God damn it, I'm hungry now. I, I also appreciate that in, in the future, birthday dinners violate or like validate HIPAA violations. Like, oh my absolutely. god, so okay. much for HIPAA is my is my note here. <laughs> Although I will say, so like yeah, Flox is happy to just HIPAA violate the fuck out of it. Although I will say that in the military, known allergies are public record to other military personnel for obvious reasons. Right, which is where yep. we learn of uh, of of Reed's possible favorite food. We find out that he's allergic to a specific enzyme that is common in pineapple. And Reed takes a kind of a inhibitor that, you know, helps him able to ingest that enzyme. So the guess is that he likes some pineapple, which I guess uh, we'll I find mean, out. It could also be that he takes it because, like, maybe the chef on Enterprise likes to cook with pineapple a lot and he doesn't feel like not eating. Right. That was my thought as well. Like, maybe he just takes it because, you know, he doesn't want to die if maybe he it's, accidentally eats yeah. something. It's the only thing he's allergic to, and this very innocuous injection he can get once a month takes care of it. Yeah, th this just further reinforces my theory that Phlox is like the cultural glue that holds Enterprise together. <laughs> <laughs> yep, 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 yep. So uh, shortly after that, the aliens are are back and send back a nice cut up of Archer's tough guy speech that tells <laughs> that tells them to to surrender their vessel, um, which I thought was a fun touch. Uh, they they try out their new phasers and and at regular power they're ineffective, which you know the par for the course for Enterprise weapons at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, they uh, Archer's like, well, we blew up that whole fucking mountain. Why don't you do that now? <laughs> <laughs> Archer's uh, like, remember that industrial accident we had? Do <laughs> yes, <laughs> copy paste. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so they quickly figure it out and uh, and they do some do some damage to the ship. So and then they go ahead. So, so their their plan here, as I understand it, is they're gonna because in in Star Trek, okay. In Star Trek, the way things work is that if you put more power into them, they will do their thing better until you put too much power in and then it explodes. And then all your consoles short circuit explode. Right. Okay. <laughs> so, yep. like, what they're going to do is put a bunch of power into the phaser to make it phaser better and mm -hmm. hope it doesn't blow up. But Correct. they've also, like, but, but in order to do this, they have too much power. So, their plan is to shunt any excess power in order to avoid it blowing things up into the grav plating to make the ship sturdier. Yeah, I'm not so sure. That's a thing they could do because that is helpful as fuck. Like, that should be <laughs> default. Just, yes, that default that well, shit, yeah. They talk about polarizing the hole all the time. It, like, it sounds like that's their 
plan to deal with energy weapons. I I Maybe. assumed polarizing meant literally like some kind of crazy magnetizing so that energy weapons just weren't as sticky to it. Yeah, but like with with just regular metal, you can make most metals magnetic by pumping enough electricity through them. Right, right, right. But this is specifically power to the grav plating. So they're mm-hmm. using yeah, they gravity. The grab so, plating. Yeah, and and and, and, it, oh. and there is a sense there. They're saying that they're using gravity as a way to reinforce the structures of the ship. I, I, I don't know how that would work, but like I get the theory, right? Yeah. Look, and it's appara- the gorilla glue of the future. <laughs> Actually, I don't get the theory. Why would that help? I don't know. Moving on. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they, they do some damage and then they fire those just such good quality torpedoes the Enterprise had. And there's like, it's like, pew, pew. <laughs> and like the, uh, the alien ship starts leaking some stuff and then runs away. Uh, torpedoes still suck. They need to get better torpedoes. So uh, they've won the day. Everything is great. They decide they're, they're not going back to Earth after all. And then we get the, uh, the Why? resolution. <laughs> why not i i don't understand i Look, don't understand why they're not going back they, Look, they earlier they're like up by their bootstraps earlier they, they're like they strapped my, those boots so hard everything my is crew fine. has managed to do in 48 <laughs> hours what it would take them two weeks at jupiter Just, that's not a good thing like that's <laughs> you that's a bad you thing. know the real reason Toxic masculinity. <laughs> God, I don't want to look weak by going back to station to fix all the damage and make sure my phasers are better. Nope, exactly. that's dumb. Totally no, stupid. Oh, man, that's, that's good thing the woman wasn't up here to, 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 to influence me. I assigned her to birthday party duty. Speaking of which, she succeeded with flying colors. Yes, yeah, she did. The pineapple was a hit. Uh, pineapple cake. All the reeds just gonna finger fuck all their pieces as he's <laughs> fucking pulled them out of that cake. Though well, he had to hold it, man. You gotta, you gotta touch everybody's cake because you know it's his birthday. So that's him just giving a little bit of himself to you. When you, I, eat I'm it. not gonna lie, I'd still eat it. Pineapple upside down <laughs> cake is fucking incredible. It is pretty good, and I don't even like pineapple like by itself. I enjoy pineapple. I don't like cooked pineapple though. Like, I'm the opposite. I like cooked pineapple. I don't like it raw. Don't like. I pineapple. appreciate all pineapple. <laughs> uh, anyway resolution of episode everybody's great the end any final thoughts on the episode it was i i know i'm gonna sound like out of the blue here because we never say this but like it wasn't good <laughs> yeah i was it was kind of let down after the last one which was was a pretty good episode yeah and i guess like i shouldn't say good or bad because it's not you know there's a lot of subjectiveness in art and stuff so like obviously i did not care for it i'm not saying the episode was bad but i like i i can i do think i can fairly say like the story was kind of poorly handled well you and, know and I just like I, I mentioned this to you before we kind of started recording and it just didn't feel like a whole lot happened. Yeah. Yeah. And and as you pointed out, the A and B plots didn't tie together in a good way. Right. So like. So I I think the real problem here is that the B plot was more interesting than the A plot. 100 <laughs> percent. Yes. Well, so actually, what was the A plot? Was the A plot getting the phasers or was the A plot the alien? I think the, the A plot was the aliens. The aliens, yeah. Phasers were just part of that. Yeah, mm. they, that's what justified them with the rush that's job. Why, they wanted. That's why the A plot did not feel as good as the B plot, because at least the B plot stuck to its own plot the whole time. The A plot is like, our conflict is the aliens, but then they're going to go away and we're going to have a new conflict about these phasers. And then we're going to have the alien conflict come back. That's like, that's like, Poor story writing 101, right? Where you have the main conflict suspend, you introduce a minor conflict, and then you bring the A conflict back. That No, you need to either run them parallel or pick one or the other. Mm. Like, it actually would have been a better episode if they didn't give a fuck about Reed's birthday, and the A plot was the aliens, while the B plot was the phasers and the disagreement between Trip and Reed. Like, that would have been a better writing episode. Because it's high-end. Right. And like, you know, the, then like the pressure of the aliens and going back to Jupiter Station and then that not working could have like applied to the conflict between Reed and Trip. And then you have your, your like, 
fun predator moment at the end where they shake hands and then they make the phasers work and you mm-hmm. know yada yada. Mm-hmm. That would have been a stronger story for right. this episode. Yeah. All right. Well, after our short break, we're going to come back and do our deep dive. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. It is time for our deep dive of this episode. And today I wanted to talk about uh, first contacts in general, kind of go over some of the more well-known ones and kind of get some some feedback on what your guys kind of favorite ones are uh, or more more memorable, at least. Oh, shit. You want it. Oh, man. So you told us that we were going to be doing first contacts earlier and you were like going to go over some of them. I didn't realize I was supposed to come prepared with a favorite one. No, no, no. No, that's fine. No, it's, it's, you don't need to be prepared. You can, you can go off the cuff. It's fine. Um, so, so obviously the, the first one that comes to my mind is, um, well, you know, the one by the, that's named the namesake of the, the, of one of my favorite Star Trek movies, which is the first contact between humans and Vulcans, which is obviously very relevant for, for Enterprise because uh, that's clearly a, a, a relationship between those two races that has a big impact on on the show but uh just the uh, i i enjoyed that first contact scene from the movie very much because you have kind of the 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 very prim and proper vulcans for lack of a better description you know very um quiet just you know arriving and then you have the the rabble the rabble of humans greeting them Mm mm-hmm um, another one that I very much enjoyed was, um, wait, 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 wait on ahead, that first ahead. one. Yes. So because you're like first contact. So I looked this up on memory alpha because I was like, is there like canonical, like first contact procedures and stuff? Um, I actually still don't know the answer to that, but mm-hmm. it turns out that they had to very specifically put in the article on memory alpha that first contact with a lowercase C is the article for the concept of first contact. Because if you capitalize the C, Mm -hmm. it becomes the historical event known as first contact. Which is the one I just Which is the one you just described. Yeah. Yes. So I, which, and the fact that that note is in there means a, they probably had to like quickly jury rig their CSS on that page in order to make sure that the page didn't automatically capitalize the title of the page. But also, I bet there were so many editors trying to capitalize it in order to go with the, you know, the style guide of a wiki that, like, they had to put this note in here. It's like, stop capitalizing this shit. <laughs> yep. So uh, I'm glad you mentioned Memory Alpha because it actually referenced something that I didn't really think about as a first contact. But uh, the Roswell UFO incident, which, of course, was, uh you know, in DS9, uh, the, the Ferengi visiting, yes. uh, R- uh, Roswell in 1947, which was just w- probably one of my favorite DS9 episodes, to be honest. Oh my God, it's so <laughs> yeah, <good. man. laughs> it's so good. Oh, I loved it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have, um, they're trying to sell advanced technology to the United States, United States in exchange for gold, which is just, just, you know, classic Ferengi. Um, but, uh, yeah, just just one of my my favorite DS Nine episodes, and one I didn't like. I said didn't really think about his first contact, but technically was the first first contact for humans. No, not no. So not according to Memory Alpha. Oh no, because there was like a nineteen thirties thing where Kirk and Spock went uh, back in time and saw I didn't episode. See that episode. Yeah, I saw a picture of it. Oh, ah, okay. There you go. Yeah, and that was like first contact between a Vulcan and human because like Spock met somebody in nineteen thirty something. Mm-hmm. We uh, we also have uh, relevance wise to the, the 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 show we're watching now, the human Klingon first contact, which I guess technically speaking would be Clang would be their first. Uh, that is what it said. Yep. Yeah, first contact. Um, which you know, I mean, it, as far as first first contacts go, probably pretty appropriate for a Klingon. You know, if something blew up, basically. Um, yeah. Which I mean, totally makes totally fits in. What did what did they call it? Because he's like, it's a such and such. Was it a clang on? What did he call it? I don't remember. They, he he said it was pronounced. He pronounced it wrong, and it was funny. Yeah, 
This is a good story. It's a good podcast story right there. I'm glad I told it. <laughs> um, there's the, of course, the Andorian first contact that uh, where the humans meet uh, the Andorians on Pajem. On, mm-hmm. uh, uh, the, well, I can't remember what the name of the episode was, but uh, um, it was the Andorian incident. Oh, sure. Yep. OK, that makes sense. Um, a lot of first contacts, which, you know, obviously makes sense for uh, for the, the time period of the show. Um, and honestly, most of the first contact type episodes they do are, are actually the more interesting ones in this in this series. Yeah, and, and that's true, I think, uh, across series, because it, it, it allows the writers to explore something new and unknown right. and have a good reason for it, as opposed right. to just like... Um, this is new and unknown because we want it to be, but it's like, no, 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 here's an alien culture. We can do something wacky, like make them, I don't know, all left-handed or something. They, sure. Sometimes, sometimes they are really lacking in, a, in imagination <laughs> for these reasons. It's like, That's oh, look, the these first... people's foreheads are a little different. Yeah. It, it's why like the first phase of any horror movie is always the best part. Cause like you haven't seen the monster yet. So it, it's just more mysterious. Hmm. Well, speaking of, of monsters, uh, probably my one of my favorite first contact episodes is is where the Federation meet the Borg first. Um, you know, Q mm. flicks them into the uh, the other quadrant of the Enterprise uh, into the other quadrant and they run into the Borg for the first time, which I love as an episode um, because of kind of how defenseless and you know minuscule they are compared to the borg they they definitely give a a sense of you know this kind of doomsday enemy yeah that episode combines two of my least favorite parts of Star i know Trek, it does which is uh-huh. you and the borg <laughs> yep i know you, you don't like the borg i do not care for the borg which is actually ironic because first contact is probably my favorite star trek movie um that is ironic the, I do not care for the Borg as a concept, and I'm sure that this will be a longer discussion once they actually show up. Mm-hmm. Um, but I find them to be too conveniently written um, because they're not I don't think they're utilized correctly because they're supposed to be like this omnipresent danger that needs to be like a central tension. But then also. They have, but the writers use them as like a tool to tell individual episode stories, which means that the good guys have to beat them. So it ends up instead of being like this incremental victory, if you want to, over the course of like, you know, years of conflict with the Borg or as just this like this omnipresent dread that is always like potentially a problem. It ends up being just like the word they use when they want to shorthand that the problem they're about to deal with is theoretically tough, but it's okay. They're going to be successful anyways. I don't know if I hundred percent agree with you Cause I mean like they stretched out like the initial work episodes over two episodes and you have kind of the, hmm. the, Three. the first, well, three. Yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah. Um, you have, you know, the Wolf 359 incident where they get, you know, fucking obliterated. <laughs> by the right, Borg. right, right. And so like, and so like the, uh, Wolf 359 is a great example of how they could have used the Borg, which is that like all, if you want the Borg to be this existential threat to the, to Starfleet, you need all of their interactions to be like that. And you need a bunch of them, or at least talk about a bunch of them, because that's a real problem that they do not know how to solve. But, it, but when that happens once, that's fine. It's kind of like, you know what it is? It's th- someone did a, st- a st- like a statistical study or some shit. And they found out that Worf is the most beaten up crew member of the next generation. <laughs> and there's a reason. The reason is because he is a Klingon. And in the shorthand of Star Trek, we know that the Klingon security officer is the toughest, strongest, most like, unbelievable human being or humanoid, I should say on the ship. So therefore, whenever the writers need to show that 
the there is real the, danger right that the enemy is really dangerous they have them punch Worf <laughs> so Worf ends up being the most abused member Poor on the Worf. show or and you so, know they throw barrels at him and break his spine right. so they set the Borg <laughs> up to be this unbelievably powerful constant problem that the galaxy is soon going to be facing because if I recall Q puts them like on the edge of the Delta Quadrant and like this shit's coming man um but then, like Worf, the Starfleet just punches the Borg in the face every single time they meet them, except for that one time where they had to show that the Borg are tough. I get what you're saying. But also, I don't think they could have effectively done that in the format that that Star Trek was in. Absolutely, they could have. Absolutely, they could have. Because all they had I... to do, all they had to do was make the Borg be something that they were scared of but not the plot of the individual episodes like rescuing people from Borg attacks or like the Borg are going to be here in 30 hours. And the plot is that, uh, the ship's fucking hyperdrive Disagree. is hyperdrive. Disagree. Jesus, the ship's warp drive isn't working and we need to get it on going. Disagree. That's how you make it work. I, I understand what you're saying, but at that point, then you're not in the same format that Star Trek was in at that time. You're in a more, season long arc as opposed to episodic. No, 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 no. I don't, I don't agree. I don't think there needs to be an arc. The Borg can't have an arc or else they're, they're defeatable. They need to be a, they need to be like an environmental hazard. Like, you know, so uh, I think, like a nebula. Are you saying that every, that any conflict with the, with the Borg shouldn't have a resolution? No, what I'm saying is that the writers should treat the Borg like, um, an environmental problem, not, a an antagonist. So I, 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 I just disagree not, with that concept. I'm sorry. I do. It's I just disagree. <laughs> I accept I, your apology. <laughs> I think they can be used in either way, but I tend to agree with Matthew on this one. Like one hey, of my the, name is Stanford. I'm sorry, Stanford. <laughs> I, I think that uh like I'm I'm not the biggest Voyager fan in the world. I quit pretty early on there. I did catch like individual episodes later on. I, I think that they do try to take it as more of like a societal issue through seven of nine. Yes. And, and Voyager does, I will say a better job, but even they do the same thing where it's like, we're in constant fear of the board. We're in constant fear of the board. We're in constant fear of the board. Okay, great, great. That's just what we're dealing with. But then when they finally actually have to go toe to toe with the Borg, of course they're successful. Like, so in, 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 in Voyager is, is funny enough because Voyager actually has the, has the least ability to make it interesting because in Voyager, they only got one ship. Once that ship's blown mm -hmm. up, the show's over. Whereas in, in next generation and, um, D space. Now, although I don't know if Borg ever showed up in DS nine. No, maybe they didn't. Um, but in next generation, the, um, you know, the Borg can show up and annihilate a ship. No fucking problem. Because like, well, we got more ships. We're, we're, we're here. Like this is where the show is, you know? So Voyager, while they did a better job generally, where the Borg were more of a setting, a central conflict, they are a central tension rather than an antagonist. When they did go toe to toe with the Borg, they suffered greatly from the fact that they were just a, a show where there was only one ship. And if that ship was lost, that was the end of the show. Okay. Understood for the purpose of time. I think we need to move on though. <laughs> <laughs> we're good. My potpourri is real short. You keep going. Well, do you guys have any other, uh, uh, any memorable first contacts, ones you liked or, or, or that I didn't mention? Hmm. Not particularly memorable, but very important to later seasons. Uh, Kirk meeting the Gorn. I say, yeah, that's certainly one. And you have the fucking fight scene. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> oh, gosh, classic. Oh man, and I've been I've been like while I've been working, I've been putting on Voyager. It's it 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 has gone straight back into like classic Star Trek choreography for fighting. Mm -hmm. And it's just like oh, there's so many two hand punches already thrown <laughs> in like the first couple episodes. <laughs> so many two hand punches. So it's like the two handed uppercut that gets mm -hmm. used a lot, like the mm -hmm. side uppercut. 
That's the roundhouse kick of Star Trek. Just did not have a fight choreographer. No, they had one. He did his job (laughs) back in the 60s. Um, Boy, so first contacts that were memorable to me. Because, like, I gotta gotta admit, my favorite episodes of Star Trek, I don't think involve first contacts. That's okay. There's a lot of good episodes. Um... Yeah, I don't know. Boy, that's a good question. You know, I maybe it's just because it's so recent in my mind. The episode it was a couple episodes ago where uh we wind up on that planet with the apothecary. Okay. That was actually I I, I like that episode a lot. I felt like it was that's very good well episode. Done. I I don't think it was anywhere, you know, it wasn't really centralized around the concept of first contact for sure. But uh but yeah, I did. I did enjoy that as well. One thing I did, I did think about too, that I liked how, because it was handled differently was kind of the introduction to the dominion because, uh, in DS nine, like the dominion and who they are is kind of like hinted about in like a number of episodes before you even meet anybody from the dominion. Like they go to the Delta quadrant and people like, you know, mention the dominion being this thing. Uh, gamma, gamma quadrant. Gamma, yes, Gamma. Um, we we're just talking about Borg, and they... right, right, right. Yeah, no, I get it. Um, but uh, I thought that yeah, was DS Nine is is all Beta and Gamma quadrants, mm-hmm. and uh, I thought it was interesting that Alpha quadrant mean no Beta and Gamma. Um, um, Bajor, that was the whole thing with the wormhole. The wormhole connects the Beta and the Gamma quadrants, no, which is alpha important quadrant. because what. Alpha quadrant. And, and no, it's the quadrant. beta quadrant. It's the alpha. Alpha is between beta and gamma. And so... I am just telling you what memory alpha says. Are you looking it up right now? Am I wrong? Yes, you are wrong. The Shit. alpha quadrant is like the human quad, the one the humans right, are in. Right, but I thought that... Mm, I thought that Bajor was in the beta quadrant, like right on the edge. Fucking alpha. hell, man. Alpha quadrant. No, it is in the alpha quadrant. Interesting. Okay, but it connects to the gamma quadrant? Yep. So who's in the beta quadrant? Is that the Romulans? Ah. Uh-huh. We go to the beta quadrant all the time. Do we? <sighs> okay, this is not for tonight. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about the quadrant system later. Um. So anyway, I think that'll, that'll put a wrap on our first contact segment here. Wait, I didn't give a favorite. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Um, let's go with, oh, hold on. I'm going to cut out a lot of this pausing because <laughs> make it sound like I had one just on the fucking ready. Maybe I'll put mine in before Rob's. Um, that's, oh, rude. Ju- that's a joke, Rob. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, you know, if I can kind of go outside of the canon that we're generally talking about, I really liked the way that like the first contact was handled in the first movie. Wait, no, they already knew the Romulans, didn't they? In, um, the Kelvin movie. Yeah. Yeah. They were aware of them. Okay. Um, I don't know if y'all remember, but when they met the Romulans in, see, I don't know if that was a first contact when they, when they dealt with the, ah, God damn it. No, I, I don't have one. Never mind. Fucking ignore me. Leo, I think Leo has one. Yeah, Leo yeah, Leo does have one. Yeah, I don't know why. I just like I don't. My brain's not sticking to any like first contact because my like my favorite episodes are not first contacts. That's all right. Well, we talked about it a bunch of them, and uh, your hate for one in particular. And uh, uh, I think after uh, our little short break here, uh, Rob has some, uh, or not Rob, uh, Stanford has some potpourri for us. Yes, I do. <laughs> Come back. So today for Potpourri, I'm going to do what I am terming today in Trek. Uh, basically, I found some stuff that's kind of going on in Star Trek right now. Um, well, Star Trek media, I didn't like check the health of like old actors or any of that stuff. Um, 
And um, I want to do these, I don't know, once a year or so, just so we can kind of keep up because like there is new Trek happening, which is kind of interesting because that didn't like before Discovery, there was quite a like a desert of Star Trek media, especially in terms of television. Yeah, between there was a pretty, pretty big gap between Enterprise and Discovery. Yes, mm, there's probably a reason for that. And we might be going through it week by week as to what that reason might have been. Um, okay. but some, for some reason, Enterprise left a bad taste in everybody's mouth. So, uh, there was had it, not been, was it Scott Bakula's singing career? <laughs> that was it. That was it. Um, so I've got a few bullet points here on some things that are going on right now. Um, so I'm going to start with Star Trek Picard, uh, Picard. Um, they wrapped their very fan servicey third season. If you haven't watched it yet, there's going to be like a minor spoiler here. I don't want to ruin it for anyone. Um, but at the end of the show, the Titan gets refit and renamed the enterprise G, which I have so many problems with, but that's not what I'm here to do right now. Um, but the captain of the enterprise G is seven of nine. Uh, and this is like, welcome to 2023. This was obviously written and done and filmed and displayed to the audience as like, uh, we're definitely going to have a show where Jerry Ryan is the captain of the enterprise G. And it's going to be a new show. Like anyone who didn't think that was going to happen. I don't think was paying proper attention. You can tell just by how those shots were done at the end of that show that that's going to happen. Right. Have you heard anything? Cause I haven't. Yeah, I have. It's called star Trek legacy. Oh, okay. Oh, so the same way that strange new worlds, uh, virally accidentally got fan petitioned to be made into a show, even though like, this is just, like I said, this is 2023 marketing right here. This is how this stuff works. It was obvious in the episodes with Pike and all the sets from right. Star Trek and all the uniforms. They're like, Oh, that's going to be its own right. show. hundred percent. Yeah. That was, that was super obvious. Yeah. Yes. The same way there was also a change.org petition because that's what this website is for. To have Star Trek Legacy be a thing. Um, and it got even more signatures, apparently, than the Strange New Worlds petition. Um, and so Star Trek Legacy is, if not officially announced, kind of like unofficially officially announced, like it's going to happen. And as I understand the general plan there from my gleanings from the internet is that it's going to be, you know, helmed by Jerry Ryan. The... Um, what is her character's name? Uh, the black woman from Picard. Oh, Rafi. Rafi, Rafi, uh, Rafi, I think is her first officer. Um, if I recall correctly, but she's definitely on the show. Yeah. Um, probably the older cast members, except for Ryan are not going to be there, but they may, that would make you sense. know, cameo every once in a while. Sure. Um, there's talk about either Mulgrew or, uh, Frank's coming back as like an admiral for that show. Although Tuvok is also an admiral, right? Because he showed up. Right. But anyway, so yes, it's called Star Trek Legacy. I don't think filming has started yet, but there's definitely been some like planning on that. Gotcha. And speaking of Strange New Worlds, the second season of that show is due to start streaming in a couple of weeks. Oh, yes. It's been very popular so far. That kept the fans pretty happy throughout the first season. Um, it didn't really have any big hiccups as far as the general fan base is concerned. Um, and so we'll, we'll see if, uh, Captain Daddy can keep it up for another season. Oh yeah. Uh, you, I, I sent you that picture from the trailer earlier. We got, uh, old Boimler <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, uh, cat, her name, Burnham. Cat, not Burnham. Burnham is from discovery. Oh, Michael Burnham. Oh, um, yeah. Tawny Newsom's character. What is her name? I can't think of it. Anyway, from lower decks are making a cameo at some point in the season, which is weird because it's both live action and they are not contemporary shows. No, they are not. So obviously there's some time travel going to happen. Yep. Um, should be interesting though. Those are very fun characters. Yes. Although I, I'm, I'm very interested to see if they manage to keep that lower decks kind of attitude in a live action format, even for a couple of scenes. Right. So yes, I did. Yes. You sent me that today. Um, but they, uh, that season is starting June 15th, which as of recording is like 20 days from now. Mm -hmm. Uh, so 
I will I will go ahead and hate watch that with everybody. <laughs> we'll oh, we'll man. be like watching it. You can hate watch it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really excited for this. Yeah. Very, mm. very much anticipating. Uh, uh, tangentially related, I was going through Memory Alpha and I happened to get to the Melora episode of DS9, the whole wheelchair thing. Um, I called dibs on that fucking episode. <laughs> what a goddamn train wreck. <laughs> Uh, so speaking of lower decks, um, that has been renewed for a fifth season. The fourth Ooh. season is going to start streaming at the end of the summer. Um, but they have renewed the fifth season of that. Such a good show. Very good show. Probably my favorite consistent Star Trek show. I got to watch that. You, really I still you haven't, haven't, you haven't watched it. Don't wait for us, man. No. You got to watch that shit. It is so good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lower decks renewed for fifth season. Uh, so Star Trek prodigy, that is the children's show, the CGI one that is on Paramount. Right. Um, it had a 20 episode first season that was kind of split in half, 10, like for a little bit, then a break, then 10 more that finished last winter. And it was picked up for a season two. That is due to start streaming this winter. Hmm. Um, I watched the first 10 episodes. I enjoyed it. I watched it with my son. Um, we have not seen the second half of that first uh, season, but uh, as far as I can tell, everyone seems to think it's it's good for what it is, which is yeah. child friendly, interesting. Uh, yeah, say so it reminds me a lot of like Star Trek Rebels or Star Wars Rebels, rather. Like if you've watched any of that show, I did not. No. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't blame you. <laughs> I did not consume any of the animated Star Wars stuff. Yeah, it's it's a it you know it's a totally totally acceptable kids animated star trek show yes uh, yes i thought it was good and cam ogre's in it which is fun yeah there's a couple voices in there um and then the only video game i could find that has released in like the last like few years believe it or not uh is a game called star trek resurgence which released this year um i don't know anything about it other than what they tell me on their website um they call it a narrative adventure game it looks kind of like mass effect but i don't think it's quite as strong of an rpg I have no idea what you're talking about. So this is, but you can, you can, you don't worry. You can, you can romance some characters in it. Well, of course oh, you can. Yeah. Sexy alien ladies. Look, I want to role play as Riker. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I need his like, I also need his little like short robe that he wears occasionally in next generation. Why were the bathrobes in next generation? <laughs> so short. So short. Like, I'm pretty sure at the wrong angle, you would have seen his balls hanging out. Like, like I was in the 90s. I don't remember robes being that short. <laughs> right, but it was, My, you know, futuristic for the 90s. So they, they expected everybody's balls to be out then. I don't, I don't know, man. My my dad 100% had a, a very short bathroom okay. more frequently. <laughs> I know your dad, and that is horrifying. <laughs> I have I have seen that robe. Yeah, and so like that's all that's all that's really kind of happening right now. There's like cons and Star Trek cruises and stuff. There's too many of those to really go into, but those are like happening a couple times a year and you know, you can you can go do that if that's your that's your jam. My parents, my mom and my stepdad go to like the Star Trek cruise every once in a while. They really enjoy it. Or go to the cons. Yeah, didn't they meet the guy who played Saru? They've met like everybody. Everyone who does the con circuits, they've met. There's a picture of Brett Spiner holding my parents' dog. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If, uh, and like I said, it's, it's like if that's your thing. Um, I don't really like conventions that much, which is ironic because I have to work at a lot of them. Maybe that's why you don't like them. <laughs> mm. Um, But um, a lot of people do obviously enjoy them because apparently the Star Trek ones still like sell out all over the country. So. Um, and so, yeah, if that's your thing, those are, those are pretty much always happening. So that is what is going on right now. Is there anything anyone's looking forward to specifically? I know you two are looking forward to strange new worlds. Yeah. Yeah. That and, uh, lower decks too, for sure. Yeah. I think that, oh. um, oh, sorry. Go ahead, bro. I was gonna say, I, I, I really got to start that series. Everyone I've talked to about it really loves it. It's very it's good. It's it's very good. It is irreverent in the right way to make it entertaining, but, but still. But it is still Star Trek. Interesting. Yes. What what era is it in? I don't even uh, know where it, it falls on the timeline. It's just post like TNG. It's 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 contemporary with Picard. It actually, might be a little before Picard because Frakes is um, hmm. 
Captain of the Titan. Right. Um, okay. Yeah, it's it's just after TNG. Or I guess, like, not even after TNG, after the movies, like the TNG movies. Right. Gotcha. Um, yeah. I am... I am tentatively looking forward to Star Trek Legacy. I think that my issues with Picard are going to go away with Star Trek Legacy. You think? And Ryan was probably the best actor in that show that yes. came like from the previous shows. You also um, get Raffi though. She's good too. Uh, I don't oh, know if you I agree. Don't care for Raffi. I don't care for Raffi. Oh no, what's your issue with Raffi? I don't know. She's just like all over the place, man. <laughs> like I think the acting's fine for her. I just, oh, oh, I oh, I thought like... you didn't like the actor. Oh, you don't no, like no, the no. character. I don't like the character. Oh, I, I I think that like, cause yeah, you're right. She was kind of all over the place. I think that they kind of fixed her in the end because she's like not an addict anymore. Although that is bad fodder for shitty writing because it is going to be very tiring if like her being an addict is the thing that defines her character throughout mm. the new show too. It's like, all right, yeah, man, Raffi fucking slides back again. Here we go. Mm. That will, that will get, get very old very quickly. So... I mean, well, I think probably, especially if they're on the same ship, I mean, obviously they're Jerry Ryan and her, Seven and, and, and Raffi's romance past will, I'm sure, come up, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot about that. Yep. Uh, that's funny. But yeah, but no, I like I like where Seven of Nine's character has gone. I think that she's going to do a good job as a captain, hell, like as a as a like the pillar of a show. And I think that it will be a much stronger story engine than Picard was. Well, that, that's going to be my question is what type of, of are we, is it going to be a, you know, story well, like season arc or. Right. Well, I'm sure it'll be a season arc because like, that's how the shows are nowadays. And I don't have a problem with that. My hope is that they do something new rather than Picard, which just did the old shit over and over again. We're good on the Borg and the Dominion and all this other nonsense. Can we just move on? do something new. Um, so hopefully that's what they do with it. So that's what that's. So I am, I am tentatively looking forward to Star Trek legacy. Although, like I said, they haven't even really started filming yet. So I'm sure it's not going to be out for another couple of years. It's going to be a bit. So, all right. And that's, and that's what's going on. So, um, I think we will call it there. Thank you everyone for joining us. Yeah, we are, we are three episodes actually published now, uh, which is, is cool. Uh, we've got some views, but like it's, it's, it's slow going. Um, because you know, we're brand new. We're new at this. The podcast itself is new. Uh, and there isn't like a YouTube recommendation algorithm for podcasts. Right. So I know we're saying it at the top and the bottom now of every show, but it really does apparently from what I understand help if you rate and review us on Apple podcasts, because they do have a light recommendation algorithm, which is basically like, this show's popular. Try this instead of like actually interest based. So, um, please, if you have a few minutes, if you like the show, if you don't like the show, lie through your teeth. I don't care, but go give us a, give us a five-star rating if you can. And, uh, and a nice review and, uh, we'll be, we'll, uh, we'll be eternally grateful. So, uh, but that will do us for tonight. Thank you so much and good night. Bye-bye. I can never tell if Rob's going to say goodbye or not. <laughs> no, I just wait for Chris to say it. <laughs> it's become our thing now. Thanks for listening to Captain's Log Supplemental. You can follow us on Twitter at PodCLS or send us hate mail at PodCLS3 at gmail.com.